The Midnight Paradox of Substation 13. You know what sucks about having a bad day? It's that it's random. That it could come at an unexpected moment that catches you off guard. Even if you're the most prepared person in the world and it'll hit you like a brick, the only thing you could do is stand firm and deal with the situation as if you delivered on any problems you faced. Don't lose composure, regain your train of thought, and don't let it overwhelm you. Embrace it, but don't ever yield to it. The sun rises on the ancient land that was once Assyria. The morning air is cold, and with cloudy skies, nothing beats having a cup of joe. Today is our last day here in northern Syria, November 18, 2018. I was deployed here in this area, near the Turkish border, for two years. Me and my fellow brothers in arms have previously done two tours in Iraq. Before arriving here in northern Syria, I was stationed in Germany for a good two years, and I had a pretty boring time being there, doing the usual exercises, training with German soldiers, and just having such an awesome time at Oktoberfest, I felt more at home in Germany than in the States. But when we were called to head for Syria, we knew that we'd be fighting terrorists. But at first we dealt with facing Islamic terrorists and militiamen. Well, we were about to transport equipment to our bases in Turkey and then to Germany. Funny how ours are presumably composed of three Pandur, APC armored ground mobility systems used by Army Special Forces stationed at our base with six BV-206S and eight M93 Fox APCs. And when one thinks of American troops using armored vehicles, they think of American-made equipment. However, that is further from the truth. Well, except on our base. Because over here we only have European-made equipment that the US Army has bought and modified. But I kind of like using them, since we first had seen these vehicles back in Iraq. But not to mention that these vehicles are very reliable and sturdy. The only American-made equipment we have on base are a dozen Humvees, three MLF-17s and five M1 Type 4 Max Pro MRAPs, along with a few armored FMTVs, which are these trucks that carry equipment, supplies and sometimes infantry. We had to make the most of what we had and do our last patrol. Wearing our IOTV body armor and helmets, we rode out in the morning. From village to village, Syrians hardly got out due to the early morning hours. So it gives us some ease. It gets tiresome to see people blocking your path. I don't want to blame them ever since dealing with Al-Qaeda and ISIL. But unlike those Syrians, whenever we patrol in Kurdish towns, the Kurds welcome us with open arms. Me and the others disembarked from our armored vehicles and patrolled the streets before heading back. Later on, we arrived on base to get ready to transfer and transport everything out of there. Turkish troops arrived to escort us back to the Turkish border, arriving with their own APCs and MRAPs. We successfully left the base and didn't leave anything behind. And just as a precaution, we had entirely dismantled it. Upon arriving at the Incirlik Air Base, head to the Geilen Kirchen NATO Air Base. I stayed in Germany for another year until I returned home. It has been six months since I left the army. I tried to find a job day after day, filling out applications, writing down my resume and meeting with managers to no avail. I needed a good job, a job that would help me stand on my feet. I have no one to be honest with. It sucks as a veteran like myself who served his country for eight years in active duty and an additional four years as a reservist in the army. I have done security, but that wasn't enough. I needed something more, something better, a career that will help me financially and something that I will have in common with. To be truthful, I have nothing to contribute to my civilian life. Sure, I spent four years at the Virginia Military Institute, or BMI when I was still in the reserves. But I was hoping that with my degree I could get something out of it. Yet I still feel out of place, meeting with veterans in meetings and hanging out with friends. But just like me, they too are having detriments. 
I was thinking about doing corrections, but that wasn't for me. Even though I was a soldier back here in the south, well, in North Mississippi that is, I had to return after helping pick up my father's belongings after he passed away just days ago. Now me and my old man weren't close. In fact, me and I were always at odds and have been getting into arguments and fights that I can't remember how many times we did. Being a soldier himself, he served in Vietnam and during the invasion of Grenada, he was once a good man. My mom passed away when I was a kid. He changed and that's when our relationship went downhill. But coming back it felt strange, now that I am alone. I can only focus on getting back to work and finishing putting these things away and donating them to charity and goodwill. The only vehicle I could drive was a Dodge Dakota pickup truck. I mean, it took a while to repair it, but it was the only transportation I had. Like Jesus Christ, being a civilian is pretty pathetic. Like there is no structure, no stability, always relying on paycheck to paycheck. Sure, I may have done way more OT over time, in private security, filling in for officers who come in late or call out. But in the end, I made those hours just to pay your bills while leaving little money in your checking and savings. But the good thing is, I have lots of rations. And my old man, once a doomsday prepper, kept a lot of rations and MREs. That was helpful when I finally got enough money to buy food and do groceries. I got both calls from my site major and operations manager telling me that there is a post that pays good money, like 1950 an hour. But the only downside is that I have been there for like 12 hours for 6 days. Truthfully, I needed to work and be on a post and not be stuck at home after a 6 to 8 hour shift, which was something that I wanted. Ever since I was posted in this substitution in the middle of nowhere, it has been calming. Not dealing with rude residents or the public for that matter was a breath of fresh air. But I learned a lot from being posted to this company as this company was in the process of shutting it down, well, trying to. Since they have so many con contractors and company employees coming in and out of the substation, and not to mention that nearby towns are in need of it, and the city and state have demanded that they first build new substations before dismantling the current one, which I am now posting. Can I be surprised that this substation is far out in the wilderness? being surrounded by trees and swamps. Of course, upon arriving here in the south, to some people, they may find it extremely creepy being out here. But since I have this guardhouse within this substation, I basically have everything I need. But it's weird how this security guardhouse has everything from emergency radios to ham radios. Well, besides the computer and landline phones, but the rest would literally last me for weeks. Sure, I have seen the road captain come by to pick up the paper reports, even though we could do it by computer. He just regularly checks everything and sometimes brings in more supplies for us. While the employees of this company bring in boxes of coffee, coffee supplies and creamers. And heck, we even brought in a water dispenser here. Every shift I do what I need to do. And I never had problems. Until now I have been hearing news of strange events happening in this region. I don't pay much attention to stuff like that. But I always find explanations for these events. It's weird. From seeing desert to woodland, it was something to get used to. Nine months later, it was my first time back at the substation as an armed private security guard. This certain electric substation was out in the middle of nowhere. I got the heads up from my captain that I'll be doing a good 13 hour shift from 1800 to 0800 due to having all available guards post events for Halloween. He explained that it would be our last day for this post. The pay was not bad for just 1950 an hour. I mean in truth I always needed the money to catch up on some bills. I know I have been doing some insane OT throughout the week and the week before, but these are hard times. And since this is our last shift here, 
at these electric substations, then it'll all be good for me. I got myself ready for work. I took everything I needed, wore my concealable bulletproof vest that can stop 9mm rounds and had a pocket that holds a 6x8 plate that can stop AK and AR rounds under a polo shirt. All I needed to wear was a khaki polo, black cargo BDUs and tactical boots, of course. I have my gun belt, my service weapon and a heavy duty jacket as the whole night will be cold as fuck. Now I must remind everyone that I'm in the south. And since I am going to be by myself throughout the whole shift without telling anyone, as I know I am not the only one who has done this, I will bring my personal weapon. Now we have black bears, coyotes, and yes, even wild hogs, as heavy as refrigerators out in this motherfucker. So I brought my HK-41 semi-automatic back on the G3, just for emergency situations and my second amendment right. But of course, I can't use it while I'm at work, as I will get fired. I need the money. Now what everyone may think is that we redneck carry around ARs, which is understandable, but for me, I like the German design ever since I was stationed in Germany during my days in the US Army. I just came to love all things German. With just four magazines put away, in the case with my rifle I headed out on my Dodge Dakota pickup with off-road tires. Yes, I am a redneck and proud of it. I use it for many purposes besides taking it to work. I stopped by a gas station to pick up some more food, just in case I needed batteries, hand sanitizer, some medication and toilet paper. I believe there should be a United Outhouse, but you have to be prepared. So I brought other necessities like food, some of my MRE, basically crackers, my canteen filled with water and two water bottles. And I know I can't bring any alcohol to work, but fuck em, I definitely know that any road captain ain't gonna come out here in the boondocks with a heavy duty lunchbox filled with food and a Yeti cooler filled with the goods. I went out an hour before my shift. I relieved the officer who was there and was ready to go. Hey Carl. Hey Mike, how was the shift went? Not good, man. How is it? Did something happen here? Nah, man, I don't want to say it. You'll laugh. Come on, man, what is it? I've seen unusual things. Things that don't make sense to me. Like what? All I can say is watch the skies. Okay, man, just go home and have a good drink. But before he went, the officer gave me a heads up about some strange things he experienced during his shift and told me to turn off the lights when nightfall begins. When I got to look at him, he was paler than a corpse as if he saw a ghost. After that, the man hauled ass with his pickup. Now this is a fenced electric substation that is 40 20 meters, with only one main entrance and exit and surrounded by dense woodland. Nothing but trees, bushes and shrubs and one dirt road that leads to the main highway, which is miles away, and power lines that connect to it. Our guardhouse is behind the main entrance. Now behind our guardhouse, there was this outdoor canopy tent. Inside there was a United ADA portable restroom and portable sink rental. Next were a water holding tank and a garbage tank. Mind you, we're out in the sticks. As I parked my truck next to the guardhouse, I believe no one should be coming. Literally behind the main entrance. Across from it, was a large building consisting of four rooms, a switchgear station and operator room, a battery and DC supply room, a KV panel room and a storage room. Right next to our guardhouse was a generator room, though there were two other outhouses or portable restrooms. All the work has been done by the workers of this company. I closed the gate to the main entrance and went inside our guardhouse. Now this guardhouse of ours is 14 by 8 with all the basic requirements installed. Like a desk with drawers, a fluorescent light, a phone jack, a desk, a computer, an air conditioner desk, organizer tray, a filing cabinet, and shelf, first aid kits, etc. 
with one main window with curtains and a door with a small window. Now I have my battery powered Milwaukee fan and Juin personal TV radio. The walls are decorated with a map of the state of Mississippi and layouts of the perimeter, sticky notes and papers taped on them with information and data. But one paper had some strange information about what to do. Well, this was something recent that I hadn't seen before. Beware of the lights in the sky, it said. Now what kind of hogwash was that? Was that officer trying to pull my leg or what? I placed my cooler, lunchbox and old army backpack down on the floor, clocked in the company's PDA and wrote my name on the sign-in sheet. Man, there are lots of officers stationed here for three years and ten months until we're replaced by another or renewed to come here. But it won't happen until mid-January. As I got myself ready for the shift, I patrolled within the perimeter, checking anything out of the ordinary and doing checkpoints by scanning each tag with our PDA, which also had a scanner installed. I couldn't patrol outside of it due to the heavy foliage, but with the wildlife in these parts, I don't want to take my chance. Especially big gators that can walk on land. Though not too far from the nearest swamp, the outside was swarming with gnats, flies and mosquitoes. Luckily I wore my heavy duty jacket and security beanie as the temperature was beginning to drop. It's strange how the substation's lights outside are off. With a flashlight on hand, I did the same patrol for the next two hours. I went back inside, wrote my report on paper and relaxed. Luckily there was this small table next to my desk that had this microwave and a coffee maker with a stack of styrofoam cups that lay next to the microwave. Under it were two boxes, one was that of Folgers and the other was a box filled with paper filters, wooden stirrers, creamers, both liquid and powder and sugars. I made my coffee and turned on my radio. There were two walkie talkies that were charging. It was odd that there should be only one guard on site. But as I read the reports from previous officers, they stated that there were actually three on site. Two security guards and one road captain are acting post supervisors, monitoring company field workers and contractors. What's even more strange is that company employees who worked on the site report unknown events happening to them. There they witnessed unusual objects in the sky and heard strange disembodied voices in the hours of the morning and afternoon. When it got to a point, they called in the police. Even the police began to see what everyone was seeing. One by one, they all became uneasy, working over here. And soon our own security guards began having the same issues. But at night... At night, one of the guards reported witnessing unnatural occurrences. It's strange that my supervisor hasn't spoken to me about this. Now, there could be some explanation as to the modified drones that people were playing tricks on. But the more I read, the more I'm starting to believe every word that they're saying. And so, I heeded the words from the officer that I was relieved of my duty and turned off the lights. Except for the lamp that was on top of the desk and that of the CCTV monitor that was looking at showing the black and white live feed from the six cameras installed. Four showing the outside and two from within the perimeter. But I closed the curtains on the main window and a small one on the door. Lowered the volume of the radio. I could hear the wind picking up outside the guardhouse. Now hearing the weather forecast on my radio, it stated that it'll be cloudy throughout the whole night. I turned off my monitor because there was no use in having it on. Then dimmed the light from the small lamp that illuminated a soft yellow glow. Now on the shelf is this standard issue NOAA and Red Cross emergency crank radio on top of a long wave and short wave radio that also radiated a green glow. And this to me is getting out of hand. Sure, I don't mind being prepared for everything, but come on, this is getting paranoid. Crazy bastards are trying to make me insecure about this shit. But I have to keep my composure and be professional. I ain't gonna let some superstitious bullshit get the better of me. 
I turned off the AC and turned on my fan as it was starting to get cold out there. Now we do have this cumbersome indoor stand fan that was in the corner, but we didn't use it. It was now 2340 and the night became colder. I used the towel that was inside the drawer as a blanket. With the ambience of the wind outside and the low volume of my radio, I began to slowly close my eyes. I suddenly woke up afterwards and saw it was just 0031. The wind just died down outside when something caught my eye on the CCTV monitor. I observed some movement on C3 that is phasing outward. No, it could be raccoons or aurora opossums, but I just disregard it. I began to heat up some of my food and took out a root beer can. I was listening to my podcast on my smartphone when suddenly the monitor and lamp began to flicker. I looked outside from the window and checked what was going on. And when I did, I couldn't barely see jack shit being that fucking dark. The clouds were covering the moon. Now I didn't want to go out just yet, as I was about to eat my food. As I did so, the monitor and lamp began to flicker again for a few seconds. Was there something going on with the power? It couldn't be. But I continued eating anyway, only to keep an eye on the CCTV monitor. As I finished my meal, I decided to walk out just to check out. And boy, it was colder than expected. The clouds just blanket the entire sky. I couldn't see a moon or a star, it was just all clouds. I can see from my G-Shock that it has already past 1 hour 30 and I use my flashlight to check around spotting around with the yellow light by patrolling within the closed perimeter and towards camera 3 there I looked to see what was wrong with it yet when I checked out nothing was wrong with that damn thing I went back toward the guardhouse with the light facing the ground so I could see where I was going and turned it off I took out my cigar from my pocket unwrapped it and stood there for a few minutes enjoying my smoke. I lit it up with my lighter and began to smoke. Having the aroma of Dominican tobacco leaves filling the air felt so damn good. Now I don't like smoking cigarettes due to all that processed out shit it has, but the imported stuff I like. And this cigar is made of all natural tobacco leaves. I had a good time puffing out the smoke. The clouds were finally dissipating from the night sky, where the moon and stars made their appearance. I could finally see the area itself until I glanced at some of the stars shifting. I could have sworn they were moving slowly away from one another. No, this couldn't be any of the satellites, as they were close to the clouds, where their movements were too instantaneous, almost as if they were moving in clockwork. There one of the stars moved away from the others and streamed towards the substation still far away. When the rest dispersed, the night became eerily quiet. No sound is coming from the woods whatsoever. And the one thing that came to mind was UFOs. I was struggling to accept the sudden appearance of a UFO. Jesus Christ, either I am seeing things, or is this the real deal? When one of the stars that moved away from the other began to change color, one was out of orange, then it became red, then back to orange. When one another followed suit, then another and another, all four of them were changing colors, primarily orange, vermilion and red. I watched as I was smoking, seeing them dance in the sky. My god, it was so quiet. The objects then suddenly spread out, streaking across the sky in opposite directions. They were literally UFOs. I hate to see what was inside those objects. Are the Martians or these so-called greys operating them? Who knows? Or maybe they are just drones. I think I just need to lay off the science fiction movies. To be honest, it scares me a bit to witness those objects in the sky. But I better not stay out here too long. I just don't want to draw any attention to those things up there. I hope they don't see me because that'll be so bad on my part. As I don't want this to be such a weird shift, Jesus Christ. I pray that they don't spot me.
Especially now that all the lights outside are off in this substation, the only thing that is working is the backup generators. It's starting to get cloudy again, the winds are picking up strength as it got chilly just now. I wanted my truck to take out my personal weapon and demo. And I know that what I'm doing is illegal and wrong since I could get in trouble by using my personal weapon, especially one that is a rifle. But I just have a bad feeling about this and seeing that doesn't seem right at all. I got the other stuff out as well as my box of rounds that I use for emergencies. Of course I got my service pistol but that won't be enough. I did one final round within the substation. When the door of the generator room was unlocked, I peeked inside and spotted a fire axe laying on the floor. I picked it up and walked back out. As I got inside the guardhouse, I just decided to close the shades. Sure, I just got frightened a bit. I lowered the volume on the radio and just kept an eye on the CCTV monitor. It was all dark inside and out. And the only thing that lit up inside the guardhouse was the green glow from the radio and the bluish grey light emanating from the CCTV monitor. I looked at every panel on that screen. Luckily those cameras are outside and have night vision. As I can see it clearly even in the cloudy sky, they could see the winds moving the branches. Until something dashed in between those trees, my eyes caught it. And again, it happened on Seabar Tree making out what seemed to be a hand with long fingers that was on the branches and a large head seems to be moving back and forth behind the foliage I don't know what it is but it seems to be a tall figure hiding behind those trees and bushes it began to get colder inside the guardhouse I wrapped myself in a towel with the coffee the only thing keeping me warm then again on C7 and on C10 all of the cameras are out all except for C3, which is the only functional camera in this place. My eyes gazed at it with such suspense until my jaw dropped from what I'd seen. Emerging from the trees was the silhouette of a tall entity. I think if I close the camera I can make a good outline of its figure. It was bald with oval shaped eyes and long arms with a slender appearance. It had no nose and a small mouth. It was wearing some sort of dark uniform of some sort with some sort of breastplate I had these strange markings or what it seems to be similar to I think hieroglyphs and cuneiforms yes I think it could be that I am no stranger to these things ever since my deployment in Iraq ages ago but as I stood there observing the fence line it spotted the camera as it did so it disappeared back into the bush I can't believe my own eyes. Am I dreaming about this? Did I witness an actual extraterrestrial? When C3 finally gave out, it was all blank. Nothing is seen. The night was dark, as the only light there was the green glow from the radio. When the radio suddenly erupted with a loud volume, there was a mechanical tone that at first sounded like static until I came to realize it was just chatter. An unknown tongue has been speaking and communicating with another. There I couldn't understand what they were saying. However, there was a third voice speaking. That of a deep, bellowing voice that I could tell. Sounded very angry. I didn't know what it was about until... We are watching you. Come out and submit. I was flabbergasted by hearing that. This is some sort of joke. No. Doesn't it know that I am here? How does it know that? And how can they know that I am in here? As the whole area is dark with all the lights off. Come out or we shall get you. I don't know who the hell this asshole is. But I ain't coming out. And if I do, I'll be packing up armed. And it is where streaks of light coming through the window blinds. I don't know what will happen next. Hell. I don't know what will even happen to me. This is what I do know. I'll fight and I won't back down. Cause right now I am shitting bricks and shaking like a pig. That's fear for you. Only the good lord could help me in this predicament. Was this it? My final moments in life. Would I actually be abducted by these aliens? 
I must think something through fast before I regret not reacting. I must get the hell out of here. Until I stepped on something loose on the floor. Under the carpet was a hatch door. How I haven't noticed this before is beyond me. I must have been so lazy that I didn't pay much attention to this guardhouse. But why was it here in the beginning? Well, that's when I stopped and just went for it. It was a small tunnel that led outside of the substation. Probably used for emergencies in case the substation was either caught on fire or by criminals wanting to break in. And come to think of it, not only is this substation out in the woods, but I have heard reports of militia groups being close to the area. But the last time I heard of them, some of them were apprehended by the FBI and state police while others escaped. However, this tunnel looked old. But I had to get out before they noticed that I was no longer in the guardhouse. This tunnel wasn't even that short, as it led me straight to a shack in the woods. It was quiet, too quiet. I don't know where I am, so I had to climb up to this tree. I stayed perched in the tree, my eyes fixed on the substation below. The world around me was silent, except for the occasional rustle of leaves and the distant hooting of an owl. The air was thick with an unshakable sense of forebodings, and the darkness seemed to press in on me from all sides after I had managed to escape the guardhouse just in time. The moment I entered the tunnel, a strange sensation washed over me, a feeling of being watched and hunted. I dared not look back as I crawled through the damp, earthy passage, the only sounds being my own ragged breaths and the muffled thud of my footsteps. Emerging into the woods, I had hoped for safety, but the eeriness of the place only intensified. The trees loomed like silent sentinels, their gnarled branches twisting into grotesque shapes against the night sky. Every shadow seemed to harbor unknown threats, and I couldn't shake the feeling that I was being pursued. Then came the noises, strange otherworldly sounds that made my skin crawl. Unearthly whispers floated on the wind, and occasionally I heard what seemed like footsteps but were not quite human. It was as if something was stalking me, just beyond the edge of my vision, playing a twisted game of cat and mouse. I kept moving, guided only by the feeble glow of the moon filtering through the dense canopy. My senses were heightened and every snap of a twig or rustle of leaves set my heart racing. The forest, once a place of solace, had become a labyrinth of fear. As I ventured deeper, the noises grew more pronounced. Strange clicks and chitters echoed through the darkness, and occasionally I glimpsed fleeting shadows darting between the trees. I couldn't tell if my mind was playing tricks on me or if something truly unnatural lurked in the shadows. Hours passed, each minute dragging like an eternity. I had lost all sense of time, my only focus was putting as much distance as possible between me and the substation. But no matter how fast I ran, the feeling of being pursued never abated. And then, just when I thought I couldn't go on, I stumbled upon a clearing. In the center of it stood an ancient, weathered stone circle illuminated by an eerie bluish light. It cast elongated shadows that danced like specters in the night. I approached cautiously, my senses on high alert. The air buzzed with an otherworldly energy, and a sense of dread settled in the pit of my stomach. I could hear the whispers more clearly now, unintelligible voices that seemed to come from all directions. In the center of the circle I saw a peculiar symbol etched into the ground, a series of intricate patterns and, and glyphs arranged in a circular formation. It pulsed with a faint ominous glow, casting an unsettling aura over the entire clearing. As I stared at the symbol, I felt a presence behind me, and I whirled around, my flashlight casting wild beams of light into the darkness. But there was nothing there, only the encroaching shadows, and then the ground beneath my feet trembled, and a deafening roar filled the air. I looked up, my heart pounding, to see a shadowy figure looming above the trees as if it were levitating. 
Its form was indistinct, shifting and riding like smoke in the wind. I could sense its malevolence and its ancient, unyielding power. I fled, my legs pumping as fast as they could carry me, the roar of the entity echoing in my ears. I didn't dare look back, fearing what I might see. The woods blurred into a nightmarish tapestry of shapes and shadows as I ran. The world around me, a chaotic whirlwind of fear and desperation. Eventually, I stumbled and fell, my body hitting the forest floor with a painful thud. I gasped for breath, my lungs burning, and chanced to glance behind me. The entity was gone, but a sense of dread lingered, as if it had seeped into the very fabric of the forest. I pressed on, my legs aching, and my mind consumed by terror. The night seemed endless, the darkness unyielding. I had no idea where I was going, only that I needed to escape the malevolent forces that pursued me. As the first light of dawn began to break on the horizon, I stumbled out of the woods and onto a desolate road. My breaths came in ragged gasps, and my entire body trembled with exhaustion and fear. But I have to keep on moving, there I spotted a patrol vehicle. I waved my hands up, flagging the cop. I didn't know what had happened in those woods, but I knew I had encountered something beyond human understanding. Something ancient and powerful, something that defied explanation. And as I was dropped off home, I felt completely safe here. When nightfall began, I listened to my radio and had a cold beer. I would never forget that night. The night I stared into the abyss and felt the abyss stare back. And as I walked away from those woods, or from substation 13, I knew I would carry the weight of that encounter with me for the rest of my days. A chilling reminder of the mysteries that lurk in the darkness, waiting to be discovered by the unsuspecting souls who dare to venture too close. Until I heard something walking on top of my roof.